Morning. Good morning. Hey, Martha. Morning, John. How are you? I am good, but I think my internet is not awake yet. <laughs> I'm amazed at how often that's an issue. For me, yeah. No names. <laughs> I've, I've been lucky. I just need help with the technology part. Yeah. Hey, Julie. Yes. Yeah. How's it going? Good. Did you do something to your hair? Oh, I just haven't dried it yet. <laughs> just oh, I was going to say it looks really good. <laughs> it's really straight when it when it's still wet. And then as it dries out, it just gets poofier. <laughs> oh, it looks good. I thought maybe you were working on the lighting or well, I, I tell you what, the pandemic made me give up dyeing it. So it's a lot grayer than it used to be. <laughs> okay, we don't need to go there. I understand that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I came to accept it. Yeah. Well, I'm forced to. Yep. <laughs> uh, speaking of hair, Ben's... Spartan a good COVID do there too. 
I really am. And I was, I washed it this morning and it's looking a little uh, nine, like 17th century and I can't find a hair tie. <laughs> I hear you. I feel like Outlander. <laughs> the hair on the keyboard. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, it could be like a 70s prog rocker. <laughs> Ben, I think there. every time we meet like this, I'm always wanting you to just play us a little tune. Just to... <laughs> oh, I leave yeah. it deliberately turned off, so I'm not tempted. <laughs> so you're not tempted? I think your presentation should be all a song <laughs> with music. Madison, I didn't think of that. We, we didn't, nothing rhymes, nothing is melodic, I don't think. <laughs> we can improvise it. I love yeah, that. Yeah, although our goal <laughs> is like a harmonious, um yeah harmonious transportation network on city streets there you go that could be good <laughs> ashley how are we doing i'm ready when you are okay i'm gonna get us going so that we can use the hour um efficiently so good morning everyone i'm gonna call the committee to order. Um, first things first, let's do a roll call for attendance, please. Okay, Anderson? Sarah? Present. Contos? Here. Harp? Here. Hess? Present. Jones? Present. Merritt? Present. Ramos? Present. Cheryl? Present. Vasika? Von Losberg? West? Present. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Um, so we continue to meet via Zoom and um, please know there are several ways to participate and stay engaged. If you're joining us today via Zoom, you can, um, and you would like to provide public comment, please use the raise and lower hand feature and we'll call on you to provide comment. You can always, um, you, if you're participating by phone, you can raise and lower your hand by pressing start nine and start six to mute and unmute yourself. You can also leave a voice message for council by calling 406-552-6012. And you can always email us at council at ci.missoula.mt.us. And all these meetings are being recorded and can be accessed via YouTube and MCAT. So with that, um, we have, let me see, no attendees in the public, so no public comment. Um, we have minutes from, ooh, where did it go, sorry. We have minutes from our past meeting. Are there any changes to those minutes? Okay, seeing none, those will stand approved. And we have one item on our agenda today, and that is um, Neighborhood Traffic Management Program and Ben Weiss and Madison are here to present on that item. So take it away, Ben. Great, thanks. I'm going to share my screen. We have a presentation prepared. Um, is everyone seeing this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to get started here. We thanks for your patience with us. This is about this presentation is maybe eight months, nine months in the making since council last summer. Um, asked us to um, look at speed, potentially reducing speed limits and ways to do that um, more uh, cohesively or in a blanket manner around town. Um, several uh, communities across North America have been 
kind of making headlines for doing that recently and the the safety benefits are uh, are pretty big and so council asked us to look at that as part of a public works manual update um, and in our research and what we found um, we we've discovered that there's a kind of a lot of moving parts and so our, our recommendation is now coming back and it's it's a more holistic and comprehensive look at um, travel speed and and just traffic issues in general in our neighborhoods uh, and on our locally owned um, lower volume streets. And so um, we're presenting uh, kind of our final recommendations about the establishment of a neighborhood traffic management program. We are gonna go over um, that research again, a review since our December meeting when we presented on, uh, on our initial findings. Um, so we're gonna talk about why we're, you know, we're gonna go more thoroughly over why we're looking at speeds, what those national trends are, what we see about speed in Missoula, and then we're gonna um, we're gonna you know kind of briefly touch on that stuff, and then spend more time on the neighborhood traffic management program. When we talk about speeds and speeding, we're talking about a few different things, um, and we're gonna try and be as precise as possible in our language today. Um, and it's something that we have talked a lot about at a staff level. So when we talk about speed. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to go to speed limits, posted speed limits, um, but we, what we try and talk about instead, so we try and differentiate between speed limits and posted speed limits and um, travel speeds. So the speeds that vehicles are actually going regardless of what the posted speed limit says. Um, and speeding is uh, typically, it's, there's a legal definition of being above the posted speed limit, but there's also a safety definition, which is above the, the speed that is um, safe and, and comfortable for all users with the uh, existing conditions, um, whether those are weather or roadway um, and, and adjacent land uses. Um, and so our number one goal at looking uh, at all this information is safety. And so uh, that's guided in Missoula by the Community Transportation Safety Plan, the document that the MPO um, created in 2013 and updated again in 2019. Um, that looks uh, specifically at intersection crashes, non-motorized crashes, and risky behaviors of which uh, speeding is one. Um, that plan is guided by Vision Zero, which is uh, began as a Scandinavian concept and is been imported to our country. Uh, it's adopted at the federal, state, and, uh, and now local level, um, which basically the premise is that people are gonna make mistakes when they're, uh, when they're driving, biking, walking, however they're getting around town. Those mistakes should not be catastrophic. And um, there's things that we can do um, with our roadway design, with our policies, with our, uh, our plans and, and programs to try and ensure that those mistakes are not catastrophic. Um, and then finally, our long range transportation plan, safety is a major factor in that. Um, that looks 30 years in the future, uh, predicts how much Missoula is growing, um, looks at the federal funding available. It's identified some mode share goals, uh, meaning the, the percentages of how people choose to get around. Um, and it's uh, the goal for currently is to triple the percentages of people biking and walking from currently between six and 8% each to close to 20% uh, for each of those modes. Um, and the, the kind of easiest, cheapest, fastest way to do that is to prioritize our neighborhood greenways. Um, and so that is also something to keep in the back of the mind uh, as we move forward in this presentation. One of the reasons that we're really excited to work on this is that uh, speeding and traffic in our neighborhoods is one of the uh, most frequent complaints and requests for service that we get from citizens. Um, and historically, our process has been kind of onerous. Uh, we, when someone says, hey, I want traffic calming on my street, we uh, meet with them, talk about the issues, and then hand them over a, an application that they need to uh, go to their neighbors, get a bunch of uh, feedback, collect some information, bring it back to the city just to get us to even look at the issue. And then once we do look at um, the issue, we then go back and if it does need a solution, we then go back to the neighborhood and ask them to pay for it. And so um, that process has been um, resulted in inequitable implementation. It's really our, our wealthier neighborhoods that, uh, that have the time and energy and money to um, follow through with that process. And that's why we really, 
only see traffic calming uh, or citizen initiated traffic calming anyway in the university district and the riverfront neighborhood. Um, another thing that we hear is that 25 is too fast for my street. You know, we, we, we frequently come back and say, you know, the state law says that 25 miles an hour is, is as far as we can set this, that's as low as we can set the speed limit and uh, drivers are going 25 and so we're not gonna do anything. And so we're really looking for ways to uh, kind of hone in on that and say, gee, is that 25 miles an hour appropriate even if we, even if the speed limit can't be changed, are there other things that we can do? Can we evaluate that for context sensitivity and, and find out, um, you know, is there, are there ways that we can actually address this? Uh, and we've also then just had a, a lack of coherent response to citizen requests for traffic calming. Like I mentioned, we hand them an application, but we have no way, uh, no good way to rank um, the severity of issues around town, um, either, uh, by themselves or really uh, against each other to help manage our, our limited resources. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Madison to talk about uh, some of the research that she did um, when looking into this. Thanks, Ben. So um, first we have speed as a problem nationally. Um, US streets are becoming especially dangerous for people walking and biking um, between 2009 in 2018, pedestrian deaths from traffic crashes in the U.S. grew by 46%. In the U.S. Only three decade high of over 35,000 people. Um, this rate means that people walking and biking are an increasingly large percentage of all fatalities on the road. Um, for the past five years, pedestrians and cyclists have accounted for almost 20% of all road fatalities, despite making up only 11% of road users. So we're facing a troubling reality in which the United States has the highest fatality rate in the industrialized world. Where other countries are seeing a decrease in their yearly traffic fatalities, the US is seeing a notable increase. Next. So it's critical not to underestimate the gravity of this threat. With each mile per hour increase in speed, the risk of injury and fatality for pedestrians is increasing exponentially. So when hit by a car going 20 miles per hour, one in 10 of us will not survive that accident. And when you increase that speed by 100%, now eight out of 10 of us will die. So this risk is calculated for the average able-bodied adult, um, while the risk of death for much younger or older pedestrians at any speed is considerably higher. Go ahead. <clears throat> so coming back to Missoula, um, we saw almost 8,000 crashes on local roads between 2007 and 2019. 2019 saw 942 crashes alone, which is a near 60% increase from that average yearly crash rate. Just to be clear, when oh. we talk about local streets here, we're talking about city owned um, streets. Most of our major roads, uh, our arterials, you know, it's not just Reserve Street and Brooks that are owned by MDT. It's Higgins, South Avenue, Third Street, Russell, Broadway, Front and Main. Um, you know, a lot of our, our major streets in town are, are controlled by MDT, and so those are not factored into this data. Yes, that's a good point. Um, slide are we on? 12. Okay. So um, the Missoula Community Transportation Safety Plan um, is where these, you know, these figures come from, where these graphs come from, and it clearly outlines speed-related crashes as a factor in only 10% of crashes, but 20% of fatalities. we well, showing us here at the city that a consistent third of speed-related crashes are happening on what Ben just mentioned, those 25 mile per hour local city-owned roads. Next. <clears throat> so these crash crashes, these crashes are not inconsequential. The money and time that we spend on responding to them is only more valuable in challenging times like we've seen with COVID. Um, and the CTSB calculates that speeding related crashes is costing the city around $49 million. Next. So if speeding is clearly not benefiting any anyone, why is it so prevalent? Um, on one hand, people perceive speeding to be less risky and more effective than it is. On the other hand, roadway design can inherently enable speeds 
far greater than posted or safe operating speeds. Um, so increased obstacles and narrow lanes increase that perception that conflict is likely and thus effectively lower speeds, whereas wide roads with little to no traffic control do the exact opposite. Next. Okay, so you've seen this before, but I wanna breeze through it again. Um, no, because we know why people are speeding, we need to look at the Missoula specific context that, you know, and contribute to why we see that high fatality rate as well. Um, so first we have wide streets, the edge of town development typically see those wider roads, that expansive visibility and creates conditions in which cars feel comfortable driving in excess of the posted speed limit. Second, um, well recently amended on paper, the standard for intersection design in Missoula has meant the drivers can only see 50 feet maximum of oncoming traffic before they physically enter the intersection. Third, the Missoula's large trucks often opt to cut through neighborhood streets, which increases risk to bicyclists and pedestrians on these roads. Fourth, Missoula's residential roads are a heterogeneous mix of bicycle, pedestrian, driving, multimodal transportation, um, essentially. And so that requires consideration for all of these users. Fifth, the weather presents ever-changing, often challenging driving conditions. And the CTSP did find that 81% of dry, or speeding driver crashes occurred on wet, snowy, or icy road conditions. And then sixth, Missoula is implementing a system of neighborhood greenways. They'll both encourage mode share and increase the pressure to address these conflicts um, between the modes. So that brings me to the primary implication of our research that is the current configuration of roadway designs and posted speeds on local roads in Missoula is not appropriate in some areas for 25 mile per hour travel speeds. Next. Okay, so through the development of this research of the project, we've looked into addressing this problem through lowering the speed limit on local roads, which we've come to you before. Um, altering roadway design to slow down or redirect that traffic flow, deploying safety campaigns, educating the public at large about speed risk and individual agency and traffic calming opportunities, and coordinating with PD in regards to their resources and capacity to increase increased, um, speed enforcement. So it quickly became very clear that no single approach would have that type of broad comprehensive reach that we needed to address the multitude of factors that contribute to speeding. Next. So instead, we're taking a systems-based approach that uses all of the above. It frames engineering, education, grassroots action, increased enforcement, and lowered speed limit as tools that may be used jointly to address high conflict areas. This largely constitutes the foundation of the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program, and now I'll hand you back to Ben to dive into the specifics of the program. Thanks, Madison. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program we see as uh, a, an update, a modernization of that traffic calming program that I mentioned in the intro. Um, basically, it's a way that we plan to uh, better utilize existing resources to address the issues that Madison just highlighted. Um, and so this is a program that we will focus on locally owned residential streets. Uh, we've developed an interdepartmental work team to, uh, to work on this from, from uh, Public Works Mobility Engineering and Planning to the Streets Division. The guy's actually out uh, working um, on the, uh, to pave and, and stripe the lanes. Um, police department, fire department, attorney's office, uh, office of neighborhoods on coordinating with, um, with citizens. Um, and we're looking at this program and how it fits into um, the community investment program, the CIP. Um, this, our, our goal with the NTMP, the Neighbor Traffic Management Program, is to um, be kind of uh, more flexible, more, uh, more nimble to, to address issues uh, in a quicker manner. And some projects might have to be elevated to the CIP and, and get in line for, for major funding, but by uh, being able to address some issues within operating budgets, within existing operating budgets, we can um, we think that we can really be more nimble. We've developed a clear workflow for both uh, a proactive implementation and a reactive response, and it utilizes the six E's of, uh, 
of traffic safety, engineering, uh, encouragement, education, enforcement, and val evaluation. And we're looking at that all through the lens of equity. Um, and the, finally, this program is uh, data-driven and really, um, yeah, it's a systems thinking approach. We're, we're collecting more data, we're, we're using it better to score projects against each other and to really identify where issues are in town. Um, so I mentioned those six E's of traffic safety, the engineering piece of it, we're uh, gonna be working on quick build traffic calming and control. Uh, so using um, simpler uh, tools such as uh, paint and, and plastic bollards and signage and things like that. Whereas historically we would, um, you know, our, our goal was to do something uh, once and do it uh, thoroughly. And while there's certainly a benefit to that approach, um, it has been cost prohibitive and, uh, and really difficult to actually get in and, and address some of the things. And by using this quick build approach, we should be able to um, not only do more projects each year, but also uh, they're adjustable, they're flexible, that we can um, look at how they're functioning and either alter those or learn lessons for future implementations. So that's uh, something that we're really uh, excited about. Uh, education, we are doing a public education awareness campaign, including uh, we'll be writing a press release uh, following this meeting. We already have the Engage Missoula page uh, built. Uh, thank you to Lori Hart for, for doing that, but we're ready to um, kind of not only deploy the information that, that we've gathered, but also collect uh, feedback from citizens on, on places where they notice issues so that we can start developing a list of places to, uh, or really continue adding to our list of places that we've already got um, where people are, are seeing issues. We're already coordinating better with PD. We keep each other in the loop about where we receive complaints about speeding and, and other traffic issues. Um, and I, you know, their resources are limited, but it's already been helpful to um, be able to, if they can't make it out somewhere, uh, for us to put the speed trailer out um, and that and vice versa. If we can't get the trailer out, maybe we can ask them to go uh, work an area a little bit and let us know what they're seeing. Um, it's just, it, again, it's helping with the communication piece. Uh, the encouragement uh, E is we've developed a suite of uh, what we're calling neighborhood energizers with um, in coordination with the Office of Neighborhoods that uh, they do help traffic calming. They also help with community building and placemaking. Um, and we'll talk more about those in a little bit. Um, evaluation, we're doing, again, lots of data collection at the front end, but also on the back end to see how well things are working. Um, and then the maintenance pieces, making sure that we're coordinating with, um, with maintenance and, and make, doing the best use of uh, our scheduling and, and funds as possible. And with equity, we're prioritizing invest health and, and disadvantaged neighborhoods, as well as historically underserved uh, places as well, or, or places that um, may have less infrastructure or um, less other projects happening in them. Um, the way that we're doing this is we're addressing different streets, even though we're talking about uh, local streets or residential streets, we've further broken those down into three different classes. Uh, we've talked about neighborhood greenways. These are low volume local streets, typically one block away from a major street that get you to all the same places that a major street gets you, but without the traffic. Um, they're more comfortable for people biking and walking. Uh, and the network uh, is found on our bike map and in all of our transportation plans. Um, and so uh, if people have further questions about that, I'm happy to answer them later, but that is um, kind of one category of street. On the other end, we have residential collectors. These are streets that, um, yes, they're in our residential neighborhoods, but they are vehicular through streets and they need to maintain um, a pretty good throughput for drivers. And But we want that to be still as safe and comfortable as possible for people, uh, especially living along those streets, but also using them to, to bike and walk. And then in, in the middle are kind of our regular local streets that don't, um, that don't kind of meet either of, of those ends. Uh, and as such, with those three, we've created different operational goals and different uh, kind of target thresholds for these. Um, and so, again, when we say target speed, that's 
um, how fast the average driver is going. It's not necessarily what we're going to recommend posting the speed limit at. Um, but we want people driving slower on neighborhood greenways so that they feel comfortable for families to be biking and walking on. Uh, often they don't have sidewalks um, and won't get them anytime soon. And so, again, we want to make them uh, as safe as possible. That VPD means vehicles per day. So our target volumes are under 1,000 vehicles per day. Um, typically, uh, in traffic engineering parlance, 10% uh, of your traffic happens during um, the evening rush hour. And so if it's a thousand cars per day, then between five and six, you'd have a hundred cars. That's uh, two cars a minute or you know less than two cars a minute. So even that is still a very, um, you don't have a lot of interaction with, with motor vehicles uh, on those streets. Um, because they're neighbor greenways, we want them to be um, convenient for people biking, especially. We want as few stop signs as possible. And we also want to uh, try and consider wayfinding elements when thinking about those, because um, especially as we try and convert people from, from driving to other modes, uh, a lot of people, if you drive on Brooks, you think, gee, I, wouldn't, I would never ride a bike on this street. But if there's, uh, and they might not know about some of the greenways that are nearby that uh, can help get you to your same destinations. Local streets, we uh, your target speed is a little bit higher. Our volumes are still low. Stop signs are certainly acceptable and maybe even desirable on local streets to help uh, reduce the instances of cut through traffic. Um, we often have to coordinate with transit as uh, mountain line and certainly um, beach transportation use local streets for stops. They're not only on our main roads. And then those residential collectors, our target speed is 25. We don't want people going faster than that, but um, but that might be reasonable there. Um, our target volumes, we say 1,000 to 6,000. Some of our residential collectors are higher volume than that. Um, and so we wanna potentially consider um, reclassifying them or looking at other interventions. Uh, one of the things that uh, our policies suggest are that sidewalks and bike lanes are strongly recommended. Um, we have administrative rules, for example, that suggest anytime a collector gets resurfaced, we should stripe bike lanes uh, on it. And, a lot of those have been prioritized within our CIP for sidewalk uh, installation as well. Um, so um, we're going to dive more into kind of each of those E's a little bit. Uh, in engineering, we um, we talk about traffic calming. We also talk about traffic control, additional stop signs. Uh, Madison touched on uh, sight triangles at intersections. It's kind of a, um, a uh, abstract concept, but as you're approaching an intersection, you need to be able to see up to the uh, cross street uh, to know if there's a vehicle coming so that you have time to slow down uh, and stop. And our sight triangles, especially in our older neighborhoods with uh, with extensive tree canopies and, uh, and on-street parking, are pretty small and might not provide the visibility to actually see oncoming traffic. And so, um, there might be opportunities to use more traffic calming control to lower speeds so that you do have more time to react to uh, to seeing people come. I'm gonna step out of this document real quick and go over to, gee, did I not open it up? I know where I can get it, here we go. So we've identified all of the traffic management tools and this comes from, um, this comes from, where is Lori? Here we go. I timed out there. Um, so this is the Engage Missoula page about this. It looks very good. Um, so our traffic management tools, we have identified a kind of whole suite of tools that are, uh, that we have to use and we have these playing cards about each of them. This is again, public facing to, so they can understand generally what it is we're talking about, the typical application, the pros and cons of each and a relative cost, and then a link for more information about uh, how and why we, and when we would deploy something like that. So we have stop and yield signs, neighborhood traffic circles, um, urban hybrid mini roundabouts. It's kind of a mouthful, but they do, there are design uh, features that differentiate these from our other circular intersections in town. Um, the only one we have currently, I believe, is at, um, this is at California and Wyoming. Um, and 
curb extensions or bulb outs uh, is another tool, uh, chicanes, which are things that, uh, obstacles that kind of force you to, to kind of uh, shift around. Phillips Street in the west side or Christian Drive up in Miller Creek are two examples of streets with, um, with chicanes. Um, chokers or pinch points, these are often um, paired with, uh, with crossings uh, and we're looking at these in a few locations, um, potentially like where the Milwaukee Trail crosses California Street might be a good um, location for something like this. Um, diverters, we currently uh, don't have any intentional uh, diverters like this in town. However, Grant Street in the Franklin of the Fort neighborhood um, has kind of an unintentional uh, couple diverters where the uh, irrigation ditch goes diagonally across the street like this. And so it allows bike ped through traffic without allowing motorized uh, traffic to go through. Um, this is a very effective tool, but one that we, we usually want to maintain the grid, and so it's one that we would use uh, very, um, you know, with a lot of care and consideration. Um, channelization or access control, the neighborhood that might use this the most is uh, kind of in the Jefferson School neighborhood over near the Brook South Russell intersection when that was redone back in 2005 or six. Um, some, the city installed some traffic calming and access control to try and mitigate the potential for people to drive through that neighborhood uh, as a cut through to avoid that signal. Uh, median refuge islands, we have several crossings like this, uh, most notably in the west side uh, across Broadway at Burton Street. There are bike lanes um, kind of across the middle of the street at a crosswalk. Vehicles can't go through, but, but um, people biking and walking can. Um, speed humps and tables are, are on the table. Uh, these are, these are different than speed bumps, which are those uh, kind of violent um, jaw breakers in the, you know, in parking lots. Um, these instead are a little, uh, they're longer, they are a little bit smoother, but they're actually more effective at, um, at more sustained speed reduction. Um, because what happens with speed bumps is people get really annoyed by them and then they speed up in between them. Uh, and these are less likely to encourage that. Um, marked crosswalks we have here, um, raised crosswalks, uh, and in-lane pedestrian signs. These are a tool that we've been using more. Um, and then rapid flashing beacons is another tool at our disposal. We do have some criteria for those, and we probably wouldn't install these through the neighborhood traffic management program. But again, this is kind of our, uh, our location where we're keeping information about all of the tools for traffic management that we use. Um, our speed trailer is an educational tool. It's uh, usually not paired with enforcement, but it does help with data collection. Um, and so it's, uh, it's something that we, you know, again, it's a city deployed um, traffic management tool. Lowering the speed limit is on the table, although again, it's one that um, state law is pretty explicit about what we can and can't do. And so uh, we'd have to do, for example, we'd have to do a, um, a traffic and engineering investigation uh, to, to lower the speed limit. And then finally, police enforcement is, is a tool that we have, uh, even though resources are limited and it's, uh, it only kind of works where it's happening in the moment. It's not a way to effectively um, address speeds all over the city. So back to the presentation. So those were kind of the engineering, education, and enforcement tools that, um, that we talked about. I'm going to turn it back to Madison to talk about the encouragement pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, as Ben said, the, uh, these pieces we've coordinated with the Office of Neighborhoods. Um, and they're essentially an assemblage of neighborhood energizers. They're publicly sourced placemaking and interventions that are meant to stimulate ideas um, around transforming and reclaiming that public space. So many of these projects and programs um, were derived from ones already seen in Missoula and from successful activations and installations in other communities. Um, they're fully intended to be grassroots efforts led by interested citizens or neighborhood leadership teams. Um, many of these quick build, as Ben keeps referencing, these Engineering interventions, they essentially provide blank canvases for community customization. Um, so if you were to enclose a space with plants, paint, you know, art, 
um, hanging bird feeders or setting out one of those little free libraries, it really does help contribute um, to, to the perception that there's this pedestrian, this public space, this environment um, that communicates a need for lower vehicle speeds. Um, and going even further, activating it with um, bicycle tours or community parties, like a Sunday streets. Um, that can very quickly and very powerfully shift that perception and accessibility of a street to drivers. Um, so these as well are, the specifics are stored um, on Engage Missoula. And each one also is set up like a playing card. It includes a basic description of the activity, um, fundamental planning and logistic information, um, potential efficacy over time at improving transportation safety. There's a little picture of it, a link to more resources. Um, and also um, we'd like to get to a point too of being able to point people directly to the point of contact, you know, whether or not you'll need city permission for a Sunday streets versus not a little free library. Um, yeah, and Ben's going through those right now. So we have 50 of them maybe. And it's, uh, it's ever evolving. And those were included, uh, I believe it was an attachment included with the agenda. So we invite you to, to go through and, and look at them. Uh, one of the things on the Engage Missoula page um, that we have is for ideas, you know, as a way to solicit feedback, we have, um, we invite people to list a note about neighborhood energizers in their neighborhoods, what they like and what they might want to see. Again, we expect those to be a kind of inspiration and springboard for people to go out and, and do these things on their own. So the evaluation E, um, I've used the term data driven is kind of buzzwordy, but we are collecting all sorts of speed volume, um, speed and volume data. That map that you see there is our crash map from 2007 to 2019. The, every dot is at least one crash and at major intersections, they can represent, each dot can represent hundreds of crashes. Um, and so it's really, uh, you know, the issue is all over town. There are certainly pockets of, of areas that haven't seen a lot of crashes, but uh, it's few and far between. But we need to, just because there's a crash there, there's a lot of uh, kind of work that goes into looking at why could that be, um, what, you know, is it someone intoxicated? Is it someone hitting a, just sideswiping a parked car in the snow? Or is it a head-on crash at 60 miles an hour, that sort of thing? And so we want to, um, with this program, we're diving deeper into crash history once we have identified a, a corridor that we're that we're working at. Um, we are certainly um, getting public input, and that's a part of the evaluation. In this process, we hope to be iterative. Um, we hope to go back and collect data after the fact and find out, gee, did we um, actually reduce speeds with um, within our implementation or uh, with some of those other tools? And um, did we reduce cut through traffic if that was the issue that we were trying to solve? What do, um, what do the neighbors think about uh, what was happening? Anecdotal feedback is certainly helpful. Um, crash history usually uh, will take, first of all, we don't get the previous year's data until May of the next year. And uh, it usually will take a few years to really register any trends on these low volume streets, um, but it's something that we will continue to look at. And then equity is just trying to infuse everything that we're doing. We're looking at, again, neighborhoods that, um, that are either in the invest health program or have uh, lower investment in other infrastructure um, or are seeing um, uh, increased impacts of infill development and, and other issues. And so we're, we're trying to, to weight projects uh, towards those neighborhoods as well. I mentioned earlier that we're taking two approaches. I'm gonna talk about the proactive approach first, um, and that is as a way to implement our neighborhood greenways. Um, we think that those streets have the, the best value from, uh, of being proactive on them because we, we know that we want to, if we can make them more comfortable for people biking walking, they will use them. It's already happened. Um, uh, when even just by publishing a map of our neighborhood greenways, we're seeing an increase in use. Um, and then with some of the pilot projects we started last year, Franklin Street and Maurice Street uh, or Maurice Avenue, 
uh, more people are using them uh, as we've made them a little bit more comfortable. So the plan is to collect and analyze data along um, some of our, our key greenway routes. Uh, we want to assess the neighboring streets as well because we don't want to uh, push any unintended consequences uh, to neighboring streets. Um, and then we select appropriate uh, interventions using some combination of quick build traffic calming, traffic control, and, and other tools uh, at our disposal. And then we'll implement and evaluate. We do the public engagement piece, writing letters to neighbors, letting them know what's happening, and then um, collecting feedback. For example, last year when we did Franklin Street, uh, we had proposed changing some of the stop control at one of the intersections. And neighbors, when we sent out the letter, neighbors came back to us and said, hey, we love the plan, except at this one place, we disagree with your decision to, to change the traffic control. And so we said, all right, you guys, Know what you want and, and know what's working so we'll, we'll leave well enough alone and, and not do that so we we do um the feedback is certainly helpful and then we'll collect data and, and revisit the area as needed again based on that table of operational goals that we're looking at for speeds and volumes so um neighbor greenways are a priority for our proactive approach we're also looking at ones that have high crash uh you know high crash numbers and then we're paying particular attention to uncontrolled intersections. It's something that um, we've had in Missoula for a long time and kind of the more people uh, move here, the more we hear about how strange it is. Um, and again, when we look at those site triangles, we realize that we might not even meet the, uh, well, we don't meet the thresholds for volumes to stop adding, to start adding uh, traffic control. Um, we certainly don't have the visibility to be able to be going 25 miles an hour down the street when they're uncontrolled intersections. So the first uh, greenway that we are looking at from this uh, perspective is Schilling in the Franklin of the Ford neighborhood. Um, and we expect to be uh, sending out letters to nearby property owners in, uh, in the not too distant future, uh, in the next week or two is my hope, uh, with an implementation sometime in uh, May or June. Um, and so, here is a map, and so Schilling is the green route. Uh, that's our neighborhood greenway from third at the right end of your screen. Uh, it, it really continues south of South Avenue and connects all the way to the Bitterroot Trail. However, the, the section south of South Avenue currently has sidewalks and stop signs and uh, does not have um, some of the crash history that the section north of South Avenue has. So we're leaving that alone for now. Um, and I mentioned that we look one street over because we don't want to push unintended consequences uh, away. In this instance, one street to the west is Eaton. That is a CIP project to get sidewalks. It's also a collector and a transit route. And so we feel like that is being addressed through the sidewalk project. Um, and then a block to the east is Kemp Street. When we looked at Kemp, uh, the volumes are higher than we want to see on a local street, the speeds are higher than we want to see on a local street, and the crash history was way higher than we want to see on a local street. And so um, we are pairing these two uh, corridors together um, to develop, again, uh, to implement traffic calming and control. So in this map, the uh, blue circles are these quick build traffic circles like we did on Franklin and Maurice last year, so signage, uh, paint, um, plastic bollards. Um, the stars are proposed bulb outs. And so these, uh, again, are, these are at the intersection of two greenways. And that's where we would use paint and bollards um, to create bulb outs on all four corners. And we would also have, we would use pavement markings as wayfinding um, with a sharrow in the center of the intersection with the chevrons going in all four directions to indicate that these are bike routes um, that people are on. Um, and then additionally on Kemp, we plan on adding four-way stop control at a couple uh, high crash locations. One was at North Avenue, another is at 10th Street. The hope is that with the combination of traffic calming control that some of the traffic that's currently speeding on Kemp um, will go slower. We know, it, we know that this will do that. We also hope that some of it is diverted to Johnson Street to the east, which is the collector and which is where we wanna see um, those higher volumes of traffic. And so currently, Kemp has is relatively wide open. Um, and so that's why we think that people are using it more than, than going to Johnson. Um, so our workflow, we've developed a, a workflow for this. So we rank and prioritize the neighborhood greenways um, based on their 
uh, connectivity, uh, equity, the crash history, and their potential to improve safety and mode shift. Um, we collect baseline data, we look at speed, volume, crashes, and intersection control and site distance, analyze that data, determine if it's functioning as intended. Um, if it is, then we document and publish the findings. If it's not, then we look at the contributing factors and um, try and develop a, a plan for traffic calming. We work with fire police um, and make sure that we have everyone on board with that. Um, and then we will go to the public, get their feedback, um, and then hope for a quick implementation. Again, because we're using these quick build techniques that are within our operational budgets, it's something that we can get out there and do um, pretty quickly. It's work that the Traffic Services Division is already doing, and we're just kind of trying to coordinate it and, and be really uh, intentional with, with how and where um, we're using these tools. Uh, and then we implement and then we evaluate it after the fact. Did it, did it meet our goals? And if it, uh, if it didn't, then we go back and analyze and see ways to improve it. And if it did, uh, then we'll document and publish our findings. The reactive response, uh, we will field the safety or volume complaint from citizens, elected officials, other staff members, et cetera. We'll learn as much as we can about those. We'll collect baseline speed and safety data. Um, we'll assess if the street meets the intended function. If it does, we'll let the complainant know and, uh, and probably move on. If it doesn't, we'll let the complainant know and say that, hey, we're working on this and we're adding it to our list. Um, in the meantime, we're going to uh, recommend um, potentially uh, some additional enforcement. We might get the trailer out there, the speed trailer for a little while. Um, we might ask them to uh, work on education, maybe of their neighbors. You know, a lot of streets that we get complaints about, the only people using them are the immediate neighbors because they don't actually connect to much. Um, and so maybe they can talk to their neighbors about ways to, to address speeding if that's the concern. Um, and we will then score all of the requests and prioritize based on scores and available funding uh, and resources. And then we'll implement the same way. We'll send letters to the public um, collect out and revisit as needed. Um, and so we, again, have a slightly different workflow for this, um, where there are a couple places where we uh, get in touch with the public. Um, if the speeds are higher, we'll let, the, um, we'll let the complainant know. And then we'll also, again, I said, um, the education enforcement pieces, we'll also make sure to point people to that, those list of neighborhood energizers so that they can uh, be working with their neighbors to uh, try and work on some of these, um, you know, non-engineering non interventions while we're working on the, uh, the top-down pieces. Um, this will all kind of flow through the transportation safety team with some ad hoc guidance from additional departments as needed. That safety team is made up of public works and mobility staff mostly um, from different divisions within that to again coordinate uh, our, our resources. Um, these workflows were also part of the attachments and they live on the Engage Missoula page. So if people want uh, to, to kind of see how we're working on that, we want to be as transparent as possible. Um, we score the projects based on uh, these eight criteria, speed, volumes, crashes, presence of sidewalks, uh, presence and condition of sidewalks, uh, including accessibility um, and how well they meet ADA. Uh, pedest nearby pedestrian generators, such as grocery stores, parks, trails, transit stops, um, healthcare facilities, uh, things like that, um, schools. Uh, connectivity, how well do these streets actually connect to the rest of our network? Um, equity, again, a big, uh, a major lens that we're looking through. And then contextual considerations such as topography or, um, yeah, weird site distances or uh, maybe lack of parallel routes. You know, um, River Road is kind of the only through street in the River Road uh neighborhood north of third and so that might need uh, additional consideration um, if we were looking at that for example. So our goals and timeline is uh, this first year is going to be a lot of data collection. I am excited about the Schilling Kemp because we did that data collection over the last fall and winter and we've developed a plan for that. That's really going to be our flagship uh, first installation this summer. Um, but this first year is going to be more data collection uh, than, than probably implementation. 
Um, we're going to get the Engage Missoula page live and, and perform some public outreach uh, and really kind of generate some enthusiasm and an awareness about this program. We're going to continue the internal coordination that's been going uh, great so far and, um, and we're only as this program um, as it, we implement it over time, it will uh, we'll probably revisit how exactly how that works. Um, this first year is probably going to see limited implementation, but our, we're shooting for um, five corridor projects per year on the proactive approach moving forward, um, and uh, and then a handful of reactive ones as well. Um, and then there's other spot improvements that again we're working. Occasionally, we just get a complaint about a particular intersection. We usually want to look corridor wide, but sometimes it really is only that intersection that um, that is an issue, and so we can be even more responsive, even though we're running it through the same through the same process. Um, so, in conclusion, this neighbor traffic management program is uh, we think it will address. Um, we can reduce the frequency and severity of crashes by slowing down neighborhood traffic. Um, we can reduce the use of residential streets for cut through vehicle traffic, uh, encourage biking and walking, reduce crash severity at uncontrolled intersections. Um, we can address the increasing traffic that we know is happening due to population growth and infill development. Um, we're dealing with decreased traffic enforcement. That's a reality. And this is program as a way to, to help manage that. Um, we're providing a clear process uh, to citizens um, so that they understand it more. Um, and we're kind of reforming the challenging and often expensive uh, requirements for citizen initiated traffic calming. And um, yeah, we're, we're excited about this, uh, about this opportunity. So with that, I'm gonna finish the presentation and turn it over, turn it back to Mirta. Thank you, Ben. Wow, that was um, super comprehensive, really interesting. Um, I'm excited to see what comes next. Um, I see a few hands up. Just really um, quickly, I wanted to ask if, because you're gonna be doing a lot of the data collection this year, wondering how, if the data collection includes um, destination points and, and more specifically, I'm wondering about schools as being uh, destination points and how, given that we don't have a safe routes to school program, at least not funded uh, from the federal government, how this, um, the, the neighborhood traffic management program could um, touch on some of the aspects that we're gonna be now um, missing from that program. That is a good question. So um, schools are certainly a component on the in the you know in that reactive response when someone uh, when a citizen says, "Hey, the speed's an issue uh, on such and such a street." We the proximity to school is a you know does help the scores, but this program is not specifically looking at school zones necessarily. Um, the again, that's one of the. When we looked, the original request was to look at speed limit reductions, and um, that is actually one of the places in state law where council has some authority and autonomy to act on their own. Um, but the uh, this the state statutes are pretty clear that in general we need to do traffic investigations um, anywhere where we want to reduce speed limits, and and that is just not a great use of our limited resources um, currently to. Uh, kind of go corridor by corridor and instead this more holistic, we landed on this recommendation for a more holistic approach to um, to try and address problems uh, that maybe just posting a speed limit sign wouldn't address. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move, we're gonna move quickly because we only have a few minutes, unfortunately, for a lot of hands up, but um, Jordan, go ahead. Thanks, and um, thanks, uh, Ben and Madison, for the, the thorough presentation and, and really exciting work. Um, I really appreciate how comprehensive this is. Um, the six E's of um, of traffic calming, I think, are, um, I mean, that that, that approach is um, has a little bit of something for everyone. Um, there are some people who will only be educated by receiving a speeding ticket. Um, there are other people for whom, um, you know, education efforts will, will work um, really well. Um, 
I think in general, I favor a lot of the, you know, the engineering solutions, the traffic, the traffic calming solutions. Um, but going off of what Mirta said, um, school zones are a particular area that um, that we do need to have safe posted speeds, um, and we need to have um, good enforcement. Um, we we've had um, just a few weeks ago um, a. a a student at Lowell School was um, was um, struck on Phillips Street, and um, I, I I don't believe speed was a factor there. But we we really need um, safe um, uh, conditions at our schools. Um, so I I guess um, I my question was along the lines of what what Mirta had had asked uh, around um, how we might achieve that, and I I wonder if um, if. Ben or Madison, if you have a perspective on whether or not we need a citywide policy on how we on how we handle school zones, um, you know, I I think it certainly could help to have a citywide policy uh, on how we handle school zones. Currently, it's kind of an ad hoc. Uh, we address them on an ad hoc basis when a school, usually a principal who is fired up about um, a recent near miss or collision, gets in touch with us and wants something to change, and then. Um, kind of emotions are high and uh, and we don't currently have a process to um, or a policy to to apply and so we're just kind of looking at the specific conditions. I think there could be a real benefit to having a, a school zone um, kind of policy and again council has um, has the authority and the autonomy to kind of set those speed limits and set those policies. Okay, I appreciate that, and I, and I will follow up and maybe uh, maybe put in a referral to that effect um, to see if we can if we can um, look more into a policy specifically around school zones. Um, I you know it is unfortunate that that state law ties our hands on on posting speeds um, on local streets, but but the school zone um, carve out and and the um, the council authority there I think is really important, um, and and we should look into that. Um, just again on on the on the broader plan. Um, I think it's. Um, I, I really commend you for the holistic approach, and um, I'm. Uh, I think that um, creating safe spaces, creating safe streets for for all users, um, is a, is a huge um, uh, goal of mine. And, and I, I I'm really um, uh, grateful for all the work you've put in on this. Thank you. Um, we're going to move really quickly, um, Julie. Thanks. Thanks, Ben, and uh, to all the staff for this really great work. I'm, I'm super excited about this and really supportive. Um, it, that having, having this really clear process is so important, and I'm sure that this has taken a lot of effort to put this together. And I'm also really appreciative of your um, first project uh, being in the Franklin to the Fort neighborhood, that uh, Kemp and Schilling Street is definitely something that's needed. Um, also, the ability to do these low cost, uh, simple solutions is, is really key. I mean, for years we've had people like, why can't we get something at the corner of 8th and Grant? And well, because there's no curb and sidewalk and there's no, you know, there's no other infrastructure there and that prevented any traffic calming from going in there. So these, these simpler solutions, I really am excited to see those. And I would love to be part of the conversation about schools because all three of the schools in my ward um, have issues. <laughs> and one of them is front burner that Ben and I need to follow up on hopefully sooner rather than later. So thanks a bunch guys. Um, Stacy. Thanks so much. I definitely want to, oh, sorry, didn't realize my video was off, um, echo the school uh, situation. And um, I also, thanks for all the data, super comprehensive. I do want to flag that I think that, um, you know, I'm concerned that the data might be a little off for this last year, given the fact that I know myself personally, I haven't been traveling as much. Schools haven't been in person for good parts of this year. And so I don't want any of, I just want to put that out there. I'm sure you guys are already flagging that, but just, um, you know, especially around safety issues going to and from schools, there hasn't been as much school traffic this year. And I don't want that to sort of um, kind of sway the results. And I also have a principal who's worked up about um, a crossing at 39th 
uh, street to get to Meadow Hill School and lots of near misses there. So I definitely think that we need to figure out how to more um, holistically address some of that. Um, and so what, um, want to willing to be on that subcommittee as well. And I think it's something important to continue to address. Thanks. Thanks, Stacy. Um, Gwen. Great. Thanks. I'll I'll be quick. Also, I. I am one of those city councilors who in the last six years, I probably sent between 25 to 30 requests, I bet to Ben and Aaron saying, I've got an issue here, a constituent says there's a problem. And then, and so it's been great. They've always been very responsive, but it has definitely been piecemeal. So I, I love this holistic approach. Um, I could ask all sorts of questions and go on forever, but a couple of things, first of all, you would think I would see the forest for the trees, but um, I didn't, even though I've referred 25 to 30 people to you over the years, Ben. And so I just wanna say thank you to Jordan Hess for last summer saying, maybe we need to dial back and have a whole more holistic view of this and um, kind of triggering that conversation. And Jordan always brings that great transportation expertise to council. So thanks Jordan for doing that. And my quick question is, I just wanna be sure I'm kind of getting a clear takeaway from this. On one hand, you're gonna be looking at it holistically and having some proactive interventions focusing on the greenways, which could change the dynamics across the city. But secondly, those individual complaints from constituents because they are the eyes on the ground are still so important. And when those bubble from the bottom up, you're then gonna look at it in more of this holistic way and see what needs to be done. And is that, there's kind of a top down as well as a bottom up scenario I'm seeing, is that? Correct, and so I just shared my screen here. Uh, hopefully you're seeing the spreadsheet. This is the list of locations that we are already seeing. Uh, we've already received complaints from just in the past uh, year or two that we've been collecting data about. And so again, those criteria are speed, volume, crashes, sidewalks, PED generators, connectivity, equity, and context. And we're seeing some of, um, you know, some of what's bubbling to the surface. Uh, some streets that we get complaints about um, when we go out and collect data don't seem to have much of an issue. And others that we think maybe there's not much going on, they, uh, they actually do have a lot more um, kind of concerns than we had initially thought. And so, yes, there is. Um, we don't know exactly what our resources will be to address all of those, but we are, um, you know, act we're doing a better job of scoring them against themselves and against each other to be able to uh, choose where where and how we try and mitigate these these issues. Thank you. Great. Great. Um, Heather. Thanks, Marta. Uh, ben, last time when you presented this, um, you had a great presentation. I'm happy to see it all again. The crashes that cost Missoulians $475 million, was that an annual figure or was that a full range over a period of time? That's a five year figure. Um, and that does not include a cost of life uh, or a value of life factor. That is just kind of the, the mathematics of insurance and uh, lost wages and uh, emergency response, you know, the time and, uh, and things like that. So uh, okay. yeah, it's a, it's a staggering figure. So that's $95 million a year that Missoulians lose wages, medical costs, expenses, property damage, and insurance costs. Can you tell us how much you plan to spend on your five corridor projects each and every year to improve safety in Missoula? Um, I would say that the based on the Franklin and Maurice installations and what we have planned for Kemp and Schilling, we're talking in the neighborhood of $5,000 per linear mile. So it's really, we're, we're talking about maybe twenty-five dollars to $30,000 in a year. Boy, that seems like an incredible amount of savings that we could be spending protecting our community. Thank you very much. Okay, last, um, Heidi. Uh, so I just uh, want to say that I really appreciate the, the toolkit portion of this report um, and really uh, giving neighbors some tools to feel like they have um, the ability to, you know, impact their built environment. I think that's huge. Um, and I also just want to add my support to um, creating some sort of a uniform policy to address school zones in Missoula. 
Um, Mirta and I met recently with Ben around uh, the, the pedestrian crash where a child was hit uh, in a crosswalk in front of Lowell, and that actually isn't a school zone currently, which I, <laughs> I go there almost every day and I didn't realize. And so I think we need to have a more proactive approach um, because waiting until somebody actually gets hurt is too late. So um, yeah, I'll just add my support for that. So thanks. Great. Um, thanks for all the questions and I'm sure you can send Ben any additional questions that you might have based on this um, presentation. Um, ben in Madison, wow, thank you. That was a lot of work and it's much appreciated. And um, I really, really appreciate uh, the amount of information and the way in which it's presented to the, the public. Um, so thanks for having all that available to the community to learn more about it or get more engaged and hopefully excited about this. Um, we are out of time um, and the boss arrived at Ben's um, studio there. So I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think we are, um, we will be adjourned. Uh, thank you so much, Ben and, and Madison. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you.